All right. Well, this is different. We have the band and some security in here. Just a handful of us today. And uh, I'm trying to think of I've preached to a smaller crowd before. Maybe in seminary I did, but the room wasn't as big. But anyway, I know there's over 100 of you online right now uh, looking at devices and, and watching, so we're so glad you're here. As Colby said, you can hashtag FBCMC with a little picture of what it's like for you to worship. Uh, you may want to don't worry about what condition your house is in or anything like that. We probably all have dirty houses right now as we've been uh, uh, isolated now for a week. And so maybe you just want to take a picture of your screen or whatever, but do that hashtag. Today I'm preaching on Acts 17, talking about the unknown God, the unknown God. I'm still going to be looking around the room probably because I'm so used to doing that. I'll try to stay in the camera. But anyway, the, un the unknown God. Well, I've been helping my seventh grader with algebra. Uh, he's been homeschooled since January, so he's used to the homeschooling. And one thing that I've relearned as I'm 40 years old learning about al algebra is that there is a variable you're trying to isolate. There, there's an unknown value you're trying to figure out. And so you have to isolate that variable over and over again until you find the value in what it means. And once it's perfectly isolated and it's on the other side of the equal sign, then that variable equals whatever you have left over that value. And let me tell you, as someone who did not do well with algebra as a seventh grader or an eighth grader, it's great being a 40-year-old figuring out that variable. It's great being a 40-year-old saying, oh, I can, I can do this. And when you isolate that variable and you figure out what the unknown value is, it's a great feeling. There are many today who are living life in the unknown. We have the unknown situation of this virus. We have the unknown situation of what the world will be like when we come out of this. And there are many people who live life with an unknown variable, something that they know is missing from their lives, but they don't know what it is. They know there's a value to it. They know that there's an answer, but they don't know what it is. Maybe today you are that person who knows there's something bigger out there, knows there's something of value out there, but you don't know what it is. Today, I hope as you join us today, you will see the answer. And that answer is Jesus. Acts chapter 17 is our passage today. I'm going to read 16 through 21 and then we'll pray. The Bible says that now Paul was waiting for them at Athens, and his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together today in houses and homes across our city and our county, as your church gathers in homes across the entire country, entire world, where this is an unprecedented time for everyone that is alive. The Father, it's my prayer today that we don't simply worship you, that we worship you in spirit and truth, that we have a burden for those who do not know you, that are living a life not knowing what the unknown is. And the Father, you would speak through me today as I preach your word, that my words would be your words, 
and that churches across the world will worship you today and that the culture, the world, the society will see there's power in Jesus. There's power when his people gather together, no matter where they are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to tell you how you can be a witness in 2020. How you can be a witness in the living in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. Number one, we just have to simply know our culture. Know the culture. Number one, know the culture. Look at verse 16. It says, now, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens. Well, who was he waiting for? Why was he waiting for? Well, Paul and Timothy and Silas had just literally been run out of town in Thessalonica for preaching the gospel. And so the Christians, the brothers, they felt for Paul's safety, and so they sent him to Athens. And so Paul found himself in a strange town, walking around the town, walking around the marketplace, learning about the culture, trying to understand who these people were, what they believed in, what they did. And it says that while he was, while he was doing this, that his spirit was provoked within him. This has the idea of being agitated, a, a, a righteous anger, if you will. And it was provoked within him as he walked around and saw that the city was full of idols. Not just, not just a few, not just some. As we would say in the South, it was slap full of idols. And he was provoked. He was agitated. And he was stirred in his heart that he was in a culture with many, many false gods leading people astray. So verse 17 says that he did what he would normally do, that he reasoned with them. He would go into the synagogues with the Jews and the devout person. So this is what he would do. He would go into the synagogues where the religious people were, and he would reason with them in some type of uh, oratorical debate back and forth. It was an educated city, a cultural metropolitan area, and they would have these reasoning and debates. And so he would go and debate the religious people, but then he would go into the marketplace, the business world, and he would also speak to them, those who weren't religious, those who weren't maybe even spiritual in some way. And that really, if you think about it, that shows the type of people that are in our culture today. Those who consider themselves religious and devout in some way, and I'm not just saying religious as a Christian, in any type of belief system. And then you have some that are in the business world that never think twice about spiritual matters. Paul would reason with them both. And it says in verse 18 that as he would do this, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers conversed with him. Well, who were the Epicureans? Who were the Stoics? Well, the Epicureans, for lack of a better word, they would be kind of the hippies of the day kind of the, the, the new age, kind of just live how you want to live, don't worry about r r consequences. Yeah, you need to have a job, but you just, kind of, you just kind of ride the wave of life, just see where life takes you. Everything will kind of work out, and, and you know, God or, or the world wants us to have this, this state of tranquility. We want to have freedom of fear. We, we want to make sure there's, there's, just live where there's no pain, and it was this type of, type of mystical feeling kind of the hippies of the day. And then you have the Stoics who were the opposite. They, they taught about how se that in order to be successful, you need to have self-control. And self-control would, would, would allow you to overcome destructive emotions. And so it was the self-growth movement. So you had some of the hippies over here. You had some of the self-growth movement over here that says you need to take responsibility for everything in your life. And they would talk and converse with him. And we have the same in our culture today. All sorts of philosophies, all sorts of uh, just ideas as to what people need to believe and how they need to live. They were a pluralistic society, much like we are. And so he had an avenue to speak his faith. It says in verse 18, some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be pre a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. See, it's not just enough 
to talk about Jesus. People believe in Jesus. Some people think Jesus was a man. Some people think he was a good teacher. Many people will say, oh yeah, I know Jesus. But it's not just enough to tell you about Jesus. You have to tell the person about what Jesus did. About how he came to live the life we couldn't live. About how he, he, was, he was killed on the cross. He died. He was buried. And on the third day, Easter Sunday, which is just a few weeks, he raised from the dead. This is a new teaching. And he's talking about his God that is alive. And our God is alive. So verse 19 says, They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you were presenting. For you're bringing some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. The Areopagus was kind of the cultural elite of the day. It was an area where the leading thinkers would sit around, and they would discuss the things of the day. And verse 21 tells us a little bit about the culture. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They wanted, they wanted the newness. They wanted the next, the newest idea. They wanted the newest fashion. They wanted to be a part of the newest and coolest church. They wanted the newest technology, the newest iPhone. The newest this, the newest that. It was a very consumer-driven culture. They wanted the new and the new and the new. They had the fear of missing out. And so they said, Paul, come on in and talk to us about it. Well, they didn't see Cummings that Paul was going to say that their lust for newness was killing them. Now, our culture is not too different from the Athenians. As I mentioned earlier, we have these type of people. We have the religious. We have the non-spiritual. We have the hippies. We have the self-growth people. Do you know the culture you live in? Do you know the gods that our culture has? Today I want to give you quickly the most common American gods that we have in our, in our country today. The most common American gods. Number one, first is the god of entertainment. The God of entertainment. Have we not had this God cut in half this week? <laughs> There's no sports. You can't go to the movies. You can't uh, go to concerts. You can't be entertained in large groups of people. Now, we can still be entertained at home. Many of us are. Many people are, are. I bet the subscriptions to Netflix and Disney Plus and all these streaming services have skyrocketed this week because people need more options to entertain them because we are an entertainment-driven culture. There are some of you today that are being entertained by this sermon even. And if it's not, if it's not uh, enough for you, you might switch over to see what another church is doing, and they might entertain you better. Entertainment. We are, it is a God in American life. And God is working on it right now with us. Number two, the second one is technology. Now, thankfully, we have technology and we can use it. But we may not realize we're worshiping it. I'm thankful that we have the technology to do what we're doing today. But it is a God. Can you imagine if we had no technology? With this virus right now, how hard it would be we, the, if the internet went down, you can't even fathom. It would be a true apocalyptic scene. That's how dependent we are on this God. Third, it's the God of money and wealth. As I look every day at the statistics of those that are dying and getting sick, I have this website that updates in real time I'm tracking because I'm a statistics guy. I like to look at these things. And I'm looking at the deaths rising and then and not as bad as they were, but the, the cases rising. I also find myself looking at the stock market. And I find some people who are more worried about the stock market dropping than they are people dying. People dying and going to hell without Jesus. 
Now, I don't have a lot of stocks, <laughs> so it doesn't, it's not a big deal to me, like maybe to some others as the stock market drops, but I know that when the stock market drops, it's not good for the economy as a whole. If it's not good for the economy as a whole, it affects me. It affects all of us, and so we all want the stock market to rise. We all want it to be steady. But when we start thinking about that more than the destination of lost souls, people who are getting the, this virus and dying today and not seeing Jesus, it's a God. Fourth, this has been a hard one for many of us, the God of freedom. You know, I don't even have the freedom to really walk around. Like, I have a camera up here that might switch to me. I don't even have the freedom, I feel like, to walk around. I have a person here and a person there. That's it, right? And I, when I preach, I like to be able to walk around a little bit and talk and, and come over here and, and get some amens over here. And there's nobody over here but Norm. We love Norm. We're thankful Norm's here. And Bethany's right there, which is great. we got a handful of people in the band. But the God of freedom is a real thing. It's a real thing. And we're losing some of that. And that scares some people. And fifth, ultimately the God of self. The God of self. We have to deny a lot of our wants right now. And God is working on these with all of us. Sometimes I think God course corrects a little bit in our lives. Usually it's regional. Right now it's worldwide. God's speaking to us today with this virus. He's getting our attention. We need to pay attention. So we need to know the culture of our day. We need to know our gods. Secondly, not only do we need to know the culture, we need to be able to engage the culture. We need to be able to engage the culture. Verse 22 shows us how Paul engaged the culture of the Athenians. Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said this, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. See, he, he starts the conversation with finding a commonality, a bridge, so to speak. You're religious, I'm religious, let's talk about that. And he says, verse 23, For as I passed along and I observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar. And it had this inscription, To the unknown God. And Paul says, what therefore you worship is unknown, I'm going to tell you who this unknown God is. You know, the culture was so accepting of other faiths, they were so pluralistic that they knew that there were other gods out there. They knew there was this unknown value, this unknown variable that they didn't know where it was. They knew that something else was out there, and so they had an altar that said, the unknown God, we don't know what it is, but it's here. Paul says, I'm going to tell you who he is. In verse 24, he tells them. He says, the God, this is the God, the God who made the world. He made the world and, and he made everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth. And he says, this God does not live in temples made by man. He says, you have temples for all these gods, but the unknown God doesn't need to be set up over here with the rest of them because he's not made to live in temples. He's not made by man. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as, that those, as though he needed anything. See, God doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He needs nothing. He is transcendent completely. He is God of all gods. He created everything. He himself is the giver. He doesn't need us. He gives. And what does he give mankind? He gives us all life. And he gives us breath. And what's the next word he says? He gives us everything. Everything. I'm thankful today what he's given us today. Amen. I'm thankful today that he's given us a room we can sit in here. We can have some semblance of worship. We'll do it again next week. I'm thankful he's giving us technology that we're using rightly to connect with people. And I know without a doubt that there will be people saved today across our country who found an online worship service and the Spirit of God caught them in their heart today. I know that's going to happen. 
God's given us all. God is completely independent. He is completely transcendent. And he gave all to us. Verse 26 says this, And he made from one man every nation of mankind. Adam, from Adam came everyone. And he made them, he says, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. I thought this is very interesting. God determined where everyone would live and when everyone would live and where they would be. So number three, how to be a witness in 2020. Number three is disciple the culture. Disciple the culture. Verse 32 says that now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. Now I have to flip back to to verse 30 and 31. We might have missed that. What he tells them is this. He says that the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. See, this is what God is telling us to do. All these gods in our life, all these things we've put our hope in. He says, now is the time to turn from those things. Why? Why do you have to repent from those false idols, those false gods? Verse 31, because it says that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man he has appointed. So one of the things our culture doesn't like to hear, doesn't want to hear, it's probably why I lost Facebook stream, I don't know why. That there is a judgment day. God is a good God. He is such a loving God. He has to deal with sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he's made a way by the man Jesus Christ. Through his death and his burial and his resurrection, he has been the man that if if he forgives you of your sins, if you place your faith in him, if you turn from your idols and place your faith in him, you have eternal life. And when God judges you, you will be deemed innocent, not guilty. And he gives us this assurance because Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus is not in a grave. He's not in a tomb. You can't visit this tomb. You can't visit his grave because he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So we need to disciple the culture. And it tells us in verse 32 that when some of them heard that Jesus was resurrected, they mocked him. And some will mock Christians today even. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But verse 34 tells us, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite, who was obviously a leader in the culture, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Part of living the Christian life is to be discipling people. Many times you can disciple the culture. They don't realize they're not following Jesus, but you can still speak into the culture you live in. As this is how Christians are. This is the unknown variable. This is the unknown value. If you're a Christian, you have the answer to this. You know the answer. You know the previously unknown. But there are people who don't know it. And as Paul says, God's close, but he's not quite there. We're going to close our time today. Issue a challenge to everyone out there that's watching. Maybe you're watching today because you have nothing to do. Maybe you're watching today because you are quarantined and you're just bored, you're just curious. And you've stumbled across this sermon, First Baptist, Monk's Corner. Maybe you don't even know where Monk's Corner is. Maybe you are in town. Maybe you have gods in your life and you realize today that they leave you unfulfilled. They leave you wanting to know the real value, the real truth. Today is the day that maybe you need to say, Jesus, I, Jesus, I turn to you today. Forgive me my sins. I I want to make you 
Lord and Savior. Maybe today is the day that you make that decision. And I want to challenge you today. If, if today you've heard this message, you've cared enough to come back and watch the second stream, you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, Today, I, I, I pray that maybe you will send us a message today. Maybe you can even comment today. Maybe you can give one of those hand emojis today. That you are placing your faith in Jesus Christ today. That you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins today. Maybe today is the day that you do that. Maybe you are a Christian already today. And there's an idol in your life you need to turn. Maybe you comment below Say, I'm turning from this idol today. I'm turning from this influence today. I am going to, during this time of social distancing, isolation, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to spend more time today, more time this week, being a disciple of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close our time today, as the band comes back up to lead us in worship today, close the service today. You would speak to our hearts as we worship you in living rooms, in cars, on job sites across our city and our town and our country today. If there is someone in here that needs Jesus, Lord, that they would feel for him and they would find him today. Father, we love you. We give this time to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.